observe the solemnity of Mary, the Holy Mother of God, and it does not take away from our worship of the Lord Jesus Christ, nor the emphasis in this Christmas season of the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord coming to share in our humanity. Because to say that Mary is the Holy Mother of God is to acknowledge who Jesus is. He's the eternal Son of God who existed before time. And then he was conceived in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary only by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus retains, keeps his divinity even as he shares in our human life. He is fully God and fully human. Two natures in one person that cannot be separated. And the church came up uh, with this title, the Theotokos, the God-bearer, because there was a heresy in the church in the third and fourth centuries that said that Mary was the mother of Jesus only in his human nature. And some Christians erroneously say that today. But to separate Jesus' human nature from his divine nature is a problem. Only God can save humanity from sin, division, and death. And so Jesus must be God if Jesus is going to be the Savior who was born to us, who is Christ and Lord. And so to say that Mary is the Holy Mother of God is to say that Jesus is God, who continued to be God, God the Son, sharing in our humanity in all things but sin, so that he could invite us to have a share in divine life. This is the gospel of Christmas, and that is the subject of my homily series during the Christmas season. For at the beginning of the angel's, me angel's message to the shepherds outside of Bethlehem, the angel said, I have good news of great joy that will be for all the people. And so... Last week, I spoke about the gospel, the good news. And that good news is that exchange of gifts that we have with our God. God unconditionally offers himself to us. He shares his life and love with us, and he invites us with his help to offer ourselves wholly and unconditionally in love to him. This is an exchange of gifts that cannot be contained to a day or to a season, God intends for it to be part of every season of our lives. God intends for it to be eternal. But each day is an opportunity to receive the gift of God and in turn offer to God the most precious gift we can offer, the gift of ourselves in love and trust. The good news is that God has come to rescue us from our iniquities. God has come to Reclaim our identity. Nothing else should define us other than who we are in God. And then that defines our relationships with others. That defines our purpose in life. We find our purpose in what we own or who we know on the earth. Uh, then uh, we're grasping at things that will not last. But our identity is in God and therefore the good news is also that the Lord restores our inheritance. He gives us everlasting life, which begins here and now. And through his teaching and example, Jesus shows us how to live here and now authentic human lives that death will not break. It's been transformed from a termination of life to a transition to life with God forever. The good news of Christmas and it brings great joy, and that's the second part of the series that I'm going to talk about today. When we receive this good news, it should give us great joy. Now, a lot of people don't remember my earlier homilies, but on Gaudete Sunday, the third Sunday of Advent, Gaudete means rejoice, I said that joy is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's the consequence of our continuing to cooperate with the very life and love of God dwelling within us. It's not dependent upon our feelings. God is there. If we've been baptized, he's there. And so we cooperate with God. And joy is a fruit of that relationship. It is an abiding confidence 
in the love and mercy of God who is always providing for us and who will work everything out for our good. And how do I know this? Because when we were wounded by sin and death, the Lord did not abandon us, but he worked that out for our good. The Lord Jesus Christ came to the earth to save us. And so he's going to work everything out for our good. According to his time, according to his ways, if we're willing to respect his time, if we're willing to live according to his ways. Joy is not dependent upon emotions. Happiness is an emotion that's tied to situations. We say Merry Christmas and we say Happy New Year, and I put that at the beginning of the call to worship because that's a traditional greeting. But uh, I don't mean to be pious, but I usually say, may you have a blessed New Year, may you have a blessed Christmas. Why? Because for some people... Christmas and the Christmas season will not always be merry, and the year may not always make them happy. But as long as you know you're blessed, you've got a joy that no one can take away from you. And that of not being happy is a situational experience that will not last. But what lasts is the very presence and love and life of God dwelling within, helping us at each step of our lives. That's why I usually say, may you have a blessed Christmas, may you have a blessed New Year. If you say Happy New Year to me after Holy Mass, I'm not offended. Don't worry, I'm not going to correct you. I'm just going to translate it to Blessed New Year, though. <laughs> Joy transcends every circumstance. For God is Emmanuel, not just at Christmas, but at every day of our lives. And he will be Emmanuel for eternity for us. God is with us. And through baptism, God is dwelling within us. And so I live life with abiding confidence in that. How can we have a joyful Christian life in this new year and every year of our lives? As we receive this good news that's supposed to be a cause of great joy for us. We look at the gospel reading and we see, first of all, the need to rejoice in the word of God. You've heard me say it before, but you know we hear temptations from the devil a lot. The same temptations over and over again and people succumb to it over and over again and they feel embarrassed when they have to confess it over and over again. So over and over again we need to hear what builds us up. As beloved children of God. What gives us joy? And so, rejoicing in the word of God. The shepherds had just heard the message of the angel. The angel said, I have good news of great joy that will be for all the people. A savior has been born for you who is Christ and Lord. And you'll see a baby lying in a manger wrapped in swaddling clothes. And then the joy of heaven was shown as other angels joined the one angel and said, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace on those whom God's favor rests. And so in response to the word of God, the shepherds went in haste to the manger. The shepherds were prompt in responding to the word of God. That was the cause of their joy. They didn't sit around and go, well, what should we do now? They acted according to the word of God given to them by the angel. And they walked in faith to the manger in a cave in Bethlehem. And when they came to that cave, they saw Mary and Joseph. And they saw two people who also promptly responded to the word of God. They may not have known that at the time, but we do. Mary. The archangel Gabriel came to reveal her role in God's saving plan. And she did not have a doubt about it, but she wanted to know how God would do it. And when the archangel said it would be by the power of the Holy Spirit and that nothing is impossible for God, Mary promptly said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be done unto me according to the word of God. Joseph, after learning from Mary that she had conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, wondered what was his role now. 
in Mary's life and in the child's life and was about to back away, thinking he had no role. The archangel said to Joseph, you do indeed have a role. You're going to be the protector and the provider of the holy family. You're going to be the companion of Mary, just as you were before she received this call. And on the eighth day after the child is born, you will have the privilege to name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And after Joseph received that word from the angel, he promptly responded positively to the word of God and received Mary into his home, the third and final stage of the marriage process in that community. But you know, even if we procrastinate in response to the word of God, God in his love and mercy promises joy. And so as we see how the shepherds and Mary and Joseph experience joy by promptly responding to the word of God in their lives, the same thing can happen to us whether we have responded promptly or we have procrastinated about it. Look at the example of Mary and Joseph again. I lift up as I did last week. They had a joy in what God was doing. Did they enjoy making the trip to Bethlehem? I doubt it. A pregnant woman on a donkey making the way to Bethlehem, about a hundred mile journey from Nazareth. I doubt it. When they uh, saw that there was no room anywhere, suitable lodging, were they happy about it? I doubt it. And then they found a cave in a dirty cave where animals lived and where animals ate and they were going to lay the eternal son of God who came to share in our humanity in a bed of hay in a manger. But they were joyful. They were saying, despite the circumstances, look what God is doing and look at what God will do. And they marveled when the shepherds told them what they had heard from the angel. Because for all they knew, They were the only ones who knew about it in that cave. And yet God spread the news and the shepherds were there. It's important to rejoice in the word of God because it tells us about a faithful God. I know that in my reading the gospels, it has caused me a better encounter with the Lord in the sacraments, for instance. And so I encourage you, make a resolution that you will read the word of God regularly, at least the Sunday gospel reading there. I guess the Archangel Gabriel is calling now. Oh, boy. Those who came in, please silence your cell phones, please. All right. <laughs> so, so the, um, <laughs> all right. So this is the second Sunday in a row in which that has distracted me. I don't get distracted by children's voices, so unless they're really shouting, shouting me down. But I do get distracted by text messages and all that. Now, I understand if you have an emergency with your family, but, you know, put it on vibrate, please. So there we have it. But I still have joy. (laughs) So joy in the word of God and in the promises of God, because God will fulfill his promise. There's also joy in the worship of God, in the sharing of our life and love with God. It happens here during Holy Mass. Jesus said, do this in memory of me. And so we never want to say to the Lord Jesus when we're able to come to Mass, I don't feel like remembering you today. That certainly is not a loving response to a command that the Lord gave out of his love for us. And just as we appreciate demonstrations of love, by others, not just by saying it. So we appreciate the demonstration of love that the Lord wants to provide for us in the sacrament of the Eucharist. But then the worship of God continues even after we leave here. To be conscious of the presence of the Lord with us, just as the shepherds were conscious of seeing what God was doing in that cave. And Mary and Joseph were worshiping the child because they knew who the child is. Rejoice in the worship of God. It cannot be dependent upon feelings. I'm not a morning person. I've wanted to be a morning person. It's not going to happen. 
now that I'm in my 50s. I doubt it's going to happen. In my first assignment, the weekday masses began at 6.30 in the morning. Lord have mercy. <laughs> but I had joy to be able to have the opportunity to celebrate Holy Mass and to worship with God's people. I may not have been on my face initially at 6.30, but eventually got there by 7 o'clock. So, but, the, uh, but it doesn't depend upon your feelings. It depends upon faith, trust in God, as he nourishes us with his very life. That gives joy there. And then there's the wonder of God. The shepherds were in wonder of what God had done. And Mary took all these things in, the gospel reading says, and she took it to heart. How much more should we reflect on what God has done in our lives and is doing in our lives? If we don't take the time to think, the enemy of our souls will think for us and say God has done nothing. Or look at what you've tried to do and look at what's happening in your life. How much are you getting from practicing your faith? When the Lord Jesus had already said, that practicing your faith will bring joy and it will cause delight, but it will also cause difficulty precisely because you're practicing the faith and some people will not appreciate it. So it's important to reflect, what has God done in our lives? What is God doing in our lives? We reflect when we come to Mass. I can never thank God enough for coming to save can never thank God enough. And it's a practice for eternity because that's what we're going to do. Praise God forever. Rejoice in the word of God. Rejoice in the worship of God. Rejoice in the wonder of God. God at work in our lives. And then we rejoice in giving witness to God. I suspect that the Blessed Mother told the evangelist Luke about what happened. Luke was not there. But she had reflected on these things in her heart and she gave witness to what God had done in her life and was doing for the life of the world. The shepherds testified to what had happened to them, not just to Mary and Joseph. But they left the cave continuing to glorify and praise God for what God had done. And I suspect that they told many others about their experience. We can grow in joy, abiding confidence in God as we give witness to one another for what God has done and is doing in our lives. It doesn't point to ourselves unless that's our intention. It points to the greatness of our God. I've said before that I have said some things about my life not to bring attention to myself, not to uh, uh, get sympathy from you, but for you to know that what I'm talking about is not a pious platitude. It's not something that I've never experienced in life. Now, I'm not going to tell it all. You don't need to hear it all. And in terms of your witness, you shouldn't tell it all. <laughs> but you should tell some things about what God has done that can encourage someone to have an abiding confidence in the goodness of God. You say, God will make a way? Well, how has God made a way for you? You say that it's important to pray? Well, how has prayer helped you? You've told someone, I will pray for you. Can you share with them what it meant for people to say that to you? Earth has no sorrow that heaven cannot hear. I hear that a lot at funerals, usually at uh, non-Catholic funerals. Well, that's wonderful. Well, how has heaven healed you when you grieve? Are we willing to be able to share concisely the concrete ways God has been present in our lives and how that joy that he has given to us has continued to build us up, continued to help us to mature as beloved children of God? Again, appropriately. We don't need to know everything. Remember once I was uh, preaching at a Catholic, sub-Catholic parishes have revivals and they had testimony time and at one point I thought with this one person, please turn the mic off. 
We don't need to hear all of what that person was talking about. That certainly wasn't a testimony. It was more of a gossip session. And people are willing to gossip. But if you're willing to gossip, but not share the good news of great joy that God gives to you, maybe you need to talk to God about that. That you're more willing to talk about gossip than what God has done and it is doing in one's life. It doesn't mean we're holier than thou. Because what did the shepherds do? They glorified and praised God. They didn't say, we deserved for the angel to come to us. They glorified and praised God for his favors. And so we do the same. I conclude with a quotation from Pope ben Emeritus Benedict XVI. Uh, he was elected after Pope uh, John Paul II, now St. John Paul II. And uh, during his... Uh, Inaugural Mass, they called it. He was the Pope once he was elected. But formally, they had an inaugural Mass. He said these words, Only when we meet the living God in Christ do we know what life is. Each of us is the result of a thought of God. Each of us is willed. Each of us is loved. Each of us is necessary. There is nothing more beautiful than to be surprised by the gospel, by the encounter with Christ. And there is nothing more beautiful than to know him and to speak to others of our friendship with him. And that is why he gave witness as he was about to breathe his last, Jesus, I love you. And that testimony, will encourage people today. God can do the same through us right now. Let us pray and ask God to send the Holy Spirit upon us to be joyful witnesses like the Blessed Mother, like St. Joseph, like those shepherds in Bethlehem.